Zen group. The South Florida Zen group has been around since the um, year 2000. And for the last few years, we practice at a Buddhist temple, Korean Buddhist temple called Bo Hyun Sa. And Bo Hyun Sa is about 15 minutes from here in the southwest branches. Some of you have already been there. Uh, there are directions how to get there on the pamphlet that you received tonight. The South Florida Zen Group is an organization that has the main purpose of just divulge and support the practice of Zen Buddhism. <coughs> and uh, the South Florida Zen Group is also affiliated with the Kwan School of Zen, which is a worldwide association of meditators founded by Korean Zen Master Sun Sun about 30 years ago. This event is here for you and for the community for two reasons. So that you can get to know the type of, of practice that we have at the South Florida Zen Group and, and to offer to the community uh, the very rare visit of Hyung Daksunin Jiro Popsa. Hyung Daksunin Jiro Popsa is a guiding teacher Young Daksunim is the guiding teacher of the Seoul Zen Center. He received Inca or permission to teach Zen uh, from Zen Master Sun in uh, 2001. 2001. And before becoming a monk, he was he went to an undergrad school in uh, Yale University and then went to Harvard Divinity School for theology and uh, philosophy studies. Yung I met him 10 years ago at the Providence Zen Center and we've stayed close ever since and today he's here with us to give this talk. Before the talk begins, I want to make a couple of announcements. There are a few events going on while he is here. This is the first one. Tomorrow, we're going to be hosting at our temple a one-day meditation retreat. So today we're going to have the opportunity to learn about Zen meditation. Tomorrow, we're going to have the opportunity to practice Zen meditation. Uh, if you're interested in attending the retreat after the talk, come and see me. The retreat has a cost of $50. And if you attend the retreat, you will also receive a copy of the, the book that Yungaksuni just recently translated from Korean called The Mirror of Zen. This book is also for sale tonight. And the price for that book is $14.95. If anybody's interested, you can uh, get your copy here. So you might even sign it for you. Uh, just a quick thing about this book was originally written by a great Korean Zen master, Seo San, in the year uh, the 1500s. Then translated from the Chinese by a very prominent Korean monk named Pop Jong Sunim. And Pop Jong Sunim himself asked Yung Dak Sunim to translate it into English. It's the first time this text is available, and it's for sale tonight. Uh, other than that, uh, I'm going to circulate a guest book sign up sheet. If you're interested in receiving our um, communications, whether it is via email or regular mail, please write your name and your information and we'll add you to our list. Once again, thank you so much for coming and I hope uh, the talk is beneficial for you. <coughs> Uh, welcome uh, to tonight's program. Uh, my name, as uh, Carlos uh, uh, introduced, my name is Hangak Hangak Sneem. Uh, I've been uh, a monk since uh, 1992. I've been practicing Buddhism since about 1987. Uh, mostly uh, right after I graduated from Yale University, uh, I started practicing Buddhism. So, according to the uh, program tonight, we're going to be talking a basic introduction to Zen, but because Zen is not a dogma or a creed or an ideology, uh, it's not uh, a teaching which is based on just hearing and believing as it is. Zen Buddhism means uh, believing our true nature, so I'll give a short talk, a short opening talk, and then uh, entertain your questions, your challenges, your uh, uh, investigations into Zen. So. Uh, Actually, that's the more interesting part of the program, rather than a one-way 
uh, talk, but rather the dialogue of uh, question and answer. Jesus taught like that, Socrates taught like that, also the Buddha taught like that. So uh, I will give a short talk, and then any sorts of questions you might have about Buddhism, about meditation, about Zen, uh, I'm very happy. Any kind is okay, any kind of religion questions, uh, I'm very happy to try to entertain for you. So uh, Zen is very simple. The word Zen is now an American word. It's an English word. You can find it in the dictionary. And, and uh, it uh, has a kind of mysterious aura connected with it. But Zen is very simple. Zen means understanding my true self, understanding my true nature. What am I? When I was born, where did I come from? When I die, where do I go? Every human being has had that question at least one time in their life. So as human beings, we are unique among living life because we can look at that. We have that question and we can investigate it. So what am I? When I was born, where did I come from? When I die, where do I go? What is my nature? Okay. So Zen Buddhism is not a religion, as you know. It's not a religion or a philosophy or a dogma or a creed or an ideology. It's not even a belief system, the way we understand religion. Zen is a collection of teachings pointing to our true nature. Pointing to our true nature. So, every day we say, I, 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 my, 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 me, 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 me. Every single day, 24 hours a day. Actually, we don't just say I with our mouths, that's a very short amount. But in our head. Even in our dreams. Oh, do they like me? I don't know. What did, the, what did they say about me? I, why did they say that? I, well, that person is a jerk. They don't really understand me. You don't understand me. I don't understand me. Oh, I, 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 I. My, 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 my. Me, 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 me. 24 hours a day, we are absolutely obsessed with this existence of I. But what is this I? What is our nature? What is this I? We don't understand that. We use this I. We talk about this I, we prove, defend, blame, and maybe analyze this I. But what is my true I? We don't look at that. So that's very interesting. There's a story that I sometimes tell uh, about this that explains it, uh, the condition of that very, very, very well. Uh, there was a, a friend of mine, he's an American monk, actually he's not alive right now physically, but uh, he was born and raised in Hawaii. His mother was Korean, his father was Chinese, so he was born and raised uh, in Hawaii as a regular American guy, but uh, obviously he's from an Asian background, so um, when he cut his hair, you know, he grew up a regular American life, you know, surfing, partying, listening to Led Zeppelin at that time, it was way before iPod. Uh, hanging out and uh, basically just having a normal life. Then, uh, but he had this great question about uh, life and death. So he uh, met this person who was my teacher, this Korean Zen master, and then he cut his hair and became a monk. So he was uh, as a monk living in Providence, Rhode Island. And one day, our teacher, this Zen master, called him, and the monk's name was Mu Dungsni, Mu Dungsni. And my teacher said, Mu Dungsni. Uh, tomorrow or the next day, uh, a great monk is coming from Korea, and this monk has never seen the United States of America. It's like 1970, 78, 1979. He's never seen the United States. So why don't you take him on a little tour around Manhattan and show him all the cool things you can see in Manhattan? Well, all the cool things that monks can see anyway. <laughs> there are many other cool things besides, but <laughs> our tour is a fairly limited program. <laughs> So he said, uh, um, you know, take him around and, and show him some of this stuff. So, you know, uh, I know a lot of people in Florida are transplanted Manhattanites or Manhattan wannabes. So you probably know a little bit about this, that in Manhattan, the most popular tour is this thing called the Circle Line. The Circle Line, it's a boat tour around, it goes the Hudson River, the East River, it goes around Manhattan, you get the Empire State Building, you get your, you get your Statue of Liberty in there, that time you used to get your, your World Trade Center view in there, you get your whole Manhattan view in that whole package, so they go on this boat, it's a really spring, beautiful day, they're on this boat looking at Manhattan. So it's Madungsnim and this Korean monk, they're both about the same size, they got the same hairstyle, they got the same clothing. So they're standing on the boat, minding their own business, watching the view. Then as they 
stood there, they noticed that at the back area of the boat, this guy with a big, one of these big sort of news television sort of camera things is carrying it. And then there's another guy with a suit and tie interviewing people. And they're interviewing just these two guys going around the back of the boat, interviewing the tourists. So as they kind of get a little closer, get a little closer, they look at Madung Sunim and this Korean monk and they smile. Because it's kind of like, we got two suckers. <laughs> they get a little closer, get a little closer, get a little closer, and then they come up to Madung Sunim. This is a really great story. I love this. This really shows what is Zen about. So as they get a little bit closer to Madung Sunim, the guy with the suit and tie, you know, he's got a little tag on that has his name. And he comes up to them and he says, uh, Hi, my name is uh, Jim Roberts, Channel 56, Community Access Television. Community Access Television. It's uh, a comedy show, The Laugh-A-Lot Show. And uh, every week we have a new question. Every week we have a question for our audience. And this week's question is, what's the most disgusting thing? <laughs> he's a real entertainer, this guy. And he points the microphone to Madunsnim, and Madunsnim says, Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy goes, Oh, uh, uh, okay. uh, we're uh, Channel 56, Community Access Television, a uh, very, uh, very popular program. I'm sure you and your friends have all seen it, Community Channel 56. Uh, you know, we have a very funny program, very good program. Every week we had a good show. This week we have a really good show, good guest, you know. Uh, lots of interesting guests. And this week's question is, every week we have a different question, this week's question is, in the whole world, we want to know what's the most disgusting thing. And they point the microphone to Madunsni. And Madunsni says, Who are you? <laughs> and the guy's like, oh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm Jim <laughs> Jim, Jim, James, Jim Roberts, uh, channel 56, 56, you know, tele, tele, television, you know, maybe, maybe in your country or on your planet they have this little box, little television, you know, he's making fun with the cameraman, is, you know, laughing behind the camera, he says, my, our, every week we have a, this is a comedy program, you know, <laughs> it's a comedy program. And uh, this week's question is, you know, what's the, what's, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the most, what's the most disgusting, what's the most disgusting thing in the whole world? We just want to know, our viewers want to know, what's the most disgusting thing? Please tell us. And he points the microphone to Madunsnim, and Madunsnim says, who are you? And the guy says, I, I'm, I'm, it says right here, I'm a very famous guy. I, I'm, I'm Jim Roberts. I'm Jim Roberts. And Madunsnim said, that's your body's name. Somebody gave you that name. Before that, you had no name. Maybe mommy or daddy give you that name. Before you had no name. So that's not your true name. That's your body's name. I don't care about your body's name. I want to hear your true name. Who are you? And the guy said, uh, um, uh, mm, Mike, cut the camera. <laughs> <laughs> mm, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And Madunsu said, That's the most disgusting thing. <laughs> You don't know you, human being. That's the most disgusting thing in this whole world. So that's a very interesting story. I like that very much. Because that's the, that is the issue. That is the issue. Human beings are most intelligent animal. But we're the only animal in the whole world that destroys the environment, attacks each other for reasons of pride or jealousy or anger to prove that my eye is better than your eye, that I knew better than you. So although we're the very highest level animal, in fact, because we don't know ourselves, because we don't know what we are, it's actually a very stupid animal in some way. So everyone uses some sort of religion or dogma or ideology or identity, group identity, religion identity, belief identity, some story or creed or theology to explain that. But as we know, in the history of religion, 
uh, we still have war, we still have suffering, we still make intense anguish for each other. So, that's uh, a human being. So there's a very famous poem in China, uh, all Zen students uh, memorize this poem. Coming empty-handed, going empty-handed. That is a human. That is a human being. Coming empty-handed, going empty-handed. That is a human. When you were born, where did you come from? When you die, where do you go? Life is like a floating cloud that just appears in the sky. Death is like a floating cloud which disappears from the sky. Life and death, coming and going, are also like that. But originally, this cloud does not exist. But there's one thing which always remains pure, pure and clear, not depending on life and death. Then our teacher will always ask us, so what is the one pure and clear thing? So some people call that God, or mind, or consciousness, or the absolute, or holiness, or true self. In Buddhism we call it true self, or true nature. Some people call it Christ nature. Soul, spirit, has many names, many names and many forms, but actually it has no real name, has no real form, yeah? Anyone who knows the Bible knows that. In the Old Testament, you couldn't say the word Yahweh, because it, even you call it God, it's not God. Even you use the word God, that's already a mistake. How can the word God, G-O-D, explain it? Has no name, has no form. Also, our Muslim brothers and sisters will understand. You never see any pictures of God in the Muslim tradition. Why can't you draw God? You know, we have in the Sistine Chapel. How's God? Sistine Chapel. God's like this. Adam's like this. We have our, 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 our old man with the big long beard in the Western tradition of God. But has no name. Is not an old grandfather. Has no name. Has no form. So human beings make this name and form, call it something, attach to this, and yet still suffer. So Zen teaching is very interesting. Socrates used to say, you must know yourself, you must know yourself. Know thyself. This teaching, know thyself, comes from Socrates. It's very fundamental. Know thyself. Just know yourself. That was the extent of Socrates' teaching. Socrates didn't have any complex uh, philosophy or belief system. Socrates only taught, know yourself. The highest value is to know yourself. Then, that's all he taught. Then one day one of the students said, Teacher, every day you say, know yourself, know yourself, know yourself. Do you know yourself? And Socrates said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know myself. But I understand this not knowing. I'm, I'm aware of this not knowing. I have insight into this not knowing. So that's very interesting. So Zen teaching teaches the same thing. Same thing. What is a human being? When we ask that question, our thinking is completely cut off. Yeah. How many fingers do you see? Right. Five. Okay. What color is the, the wall there? Uh, what state are we in? Okay. And how many states are there in the United States? And how many, what year is it? 2007. Great. Wow. Right. Number one. PhD. <laughs> so anytime, from, training, from training and from habit and from our whole educational construct that we have here, a question leads to an answer. A question leads to an answer. A question leads to some object, some answer, a number, a color, a date, a place, a thing, an idea, a concept. Any question leads to an answer. But what's really interesting, when we sit down, anyone who's had a close family member die knows this. Everyone in this room, therefore, knows this. But when we ask, what am I? When we ask, where did that person go, really? When we ask, what is that person doing now? Or why? When we ask that, our thinking is cut off. It's completely cut off. Our thinking can't go there. It's the only question that leads to not knowing. So, Zen meditation... Actually, Descartes taught the same thing. I think, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore this I is. This I comes from thinking. 
So Christian thinking, Christian eye. American thinking, American eye. Pakistani thinking, Pakistani eye. Conservative thinking, conservative eye. Buddhist thinking, Buddhist eye. Thinking makes this eye. But where does this eye come from? What is my true eye? Not this eye of words and speech. So Zen teaching is pointing at that. So Zen teaching is sometimes characterized in many people's minds by a certain mystery, a certain uh, inability to explain things uh, in a way that is very, um, how can I say it, easily graspable. For many people, Zen means a certain kind of mystery. Actually, it's not a mystery at all. Zen is not a mystery. Even Jesus in the Bible, you see his students asking him. It's really amazing. I love these these tension-filled dialogues, the students say, you know, why can't you tell us a normal story? Why do you have to answer in these parables, basically? Why do you answer us in these, these inscrutable parables? And he says, you have eyes, yet you don't see. And you have ears, yet you don't hear. If you really saw with your eyes and heard with your ears, you would know what I was talking about. So that's why it seems mysterious. So Zen teaching is the same way. Zen teaching uses freedom from words and speech to point to our true nature. So, uh, I, uh, as Carlos may have hinted at or is in the brochure, I uh, uh, was raised Catholic in New Jersey. In, uh, the, I was born in 1964, so I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, at that time, the Vietnam War, uh, much like the little situation we have going on now in the world, um, uh, the Vietnam War was going on, and there was also the question in the 1970s and 80s of the arising of, of such weird things as uh, the, the AIDS epidemic. I remember as a little kid, my sister, uh, who's a, a very devoted and accomplished nurse, uh, she works in the maternity ward, ward of the hospital, and she used to come home. My mother was a very devout Catholic, and my sister, my oldest sister, used to come home from school, uh, from the hospital. And she would say, Mom, today in the hospital, a baby was born with horrible deformity. A baby was born today, and instead of, instead of arms, had flippers like a fish. It was 1970s. We were learning a little bit about the, the environmental pollution from the Second World War. We started to learn that time, and our environmental laws started to appear mostly at that time. And so another time, another baby was born with the lungs outside the body. We've all heard of this. Another baby was born with its head, just a cleft in their head, wide open. So my sister said to my mother, why? What kind of a loving being would permit this sort of suffering and war and pain and disease? What kind of loving being would uh, permit that? So my mother, who was a very intelligent woman too, she's a PhD in biochemistry, uh, she said, we cannot know that, only we must believe that is God's plan. That is God's plan. And my sister said, if it, is it okay if I don't believe in God's plan anymore? <laughs> I remember as a little kid, you know, looking at my, I don't know, I wasn't into coloring books much, but looking at my books and doing my homework and looking up at this dialogue and really getting this shock. So, what is the reason for this? So, in my mind, uh, as I went and asked my teachers for explanations about it, they would say, just believe. Just believe. We cannot know it. Just believe. So this didn't seem like a very good uh, uh, way to answer things, especially when I was uh, in the 1980s. I, I worked in an AIDS clinic in uh, near Yale University, uh, in uh, actually in Boston after I got out of Yale. And uh, uh, I saw these people would bring a lot of their babies in, and the babies from birth, because the mother had AIDS, the baby had AIDS from birth. So through no choice of any kind of, um, you know, using intravenous drugs or anything, or he didn't even have a blood transfusion, so much that kind of choice or not, which really isn't, was just born in this condition and would suffer and have nothing but pain and expense for a family that had the money. So I would look at that and I'd say, this little baby, why? Also, I was growing up and I was born uh, in an uh, upper middle class family in, in Joyzee, and uh, I had, uh, would look at the TV and see these little kids born in Africa at the same time, same age. Kids, I could see, you know, they look like they're the same age, but no food, no medicine, no education, no peace, no house, no hope. So I had this really deep question burning inside me all the time. Why? Why? Why I was born here like this, 
And they were born there like that. Why? What is the reason why? So I used to ask my religious leaders at church and at school all the time, why? And they would just say, that is God's plan. That is simply God's plan. So I would listen to this and try to accept it, but I couldn't accept it. So I knew there had to be some reason. There had to be, whether I liked it or not. So this is where uh, I began to look inside. And as I was at Yale studying philosophy and uh, trying to find the meaning of life through uh, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and uh, Hegel and Kierkegaard and Camus, my teachers would say, when I would ask, what is truth? They would say, just read this, 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 this. And I said, well, what is truth? They would say, just read this, 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 this. Well, what is the real meaning of truth? Well, read what this person said about this person saying about this, 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 this. So it's very interesting to me that all they were telling me to do was just to absorb more and more and more and more and more. And when I looked at them, I didn't see that their lives for all that they had accumulated were any more uh, clearer or interesting. So uh, when I got out of college, I looked at a Buddhist book, uh, a Zen book, and it completely connected with that. Completely was it's actually, it didn't teach me anything, it kind of confirmed what I already suspected all along in some ways. So then I uh, met this uh, Korean monk, uh, his name is Zen Master Sun San, and uh, he was, at that time I'd uh, gone to the, I was at the Harvard Divinity School studying uh, for ministry of some kind, and uh, I went, I had a, was allowed to have a, a meeting with him. I went into him and I said, oh, so I understand this and this about Western philosophy, and I, I understand that. I want to put Western philosophy together with Buddhism, and I really think that Jesus' teachings has a meeting point with Jesus' teachings and Buddhism, and I want to know, well, 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 how should I do that with meditation? How should I study? And he yelled at me, who are you? <laughs> and it was like someone punching me directly in the, in the middle of my stomach. None of my Harvard or Yale professors had ever turned the question back to me. When I asked them a question, it was always, read this, read this, this, this. You need to know this, 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 this. But here was a person who totally turned it right back to me and said, who are you? And I said, just like in that dialogue, the same exact situation, I said, I don't know. And he said, study that. <laughs> and I said, wow. <laughs> now someone's talking to me I don't know I don't know myself so he said study that and so I really got it that that was the way actually that's not, this is not unique to Buddhism we know from the Bible that Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within and Jesus said that actually that's why he was not allowed to live a long time. Because he said in front of the high priests and all the religion figures and everything, he said, it's not out there. It's not how much you give to the, to the temple or to the community and then you get to go there. But the kingdom of heaven is within. The kingdom of heaven is within. So, uh, also we know in the Christian tradition in the 14th century, this very great book called The Cloud of Unknowing. If you ever have a chance, take a look at it. It was written by a, an unknown monk in England in, I think, the, I don't know. My religion professors at Harvard would be sorely disappointed with me. But <laughs> meditation kind of cleans all that stuff away. <laughs> uh, I, this, the great book, The Cloud of Unknowing, look at it. And basically, the cloud of unknowing, the cloud of not knowing, in this, this mystic, this monk, it's a classic text from uh, medieval England, he writes, if you want to see the face of God, if you want to see the face of the divinity, the face of God, throw away ritual and ceremony and enter the <coughs> cloud of unknowing. So it's the same point. The same point. My teacher asking me, who are you? What are you? I, I, thinking completely... <coughs> Study that. So that's a very interesting point. So, Zen Buddhism is a collection of teachings deriving from uh, Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago, descending. Not a collection of beliefs that one believes in as a creed or a dogma, but rather sitting and looking, 
sitting and looking with this question at my fundamental nature. What am I? So everyone thinks that their thinking is this I. Thinking appears and disappears. Appears and disappears. Appears, stays for a moment and disappears. We think that thinking is I. But that's not my true nature. Where does that thinking come from? Looking at that is Zen. So, um, there are many other ways to describe Zen, but perhaps the easiest way to describe it is uh, a, uh, how close it is to everyday life. A monk once entered the monastery uh, in China many centuries and said to the master there, Teacher, I've come to the monastery to learn the way. I've come to learn the way, to learn Dharma, to learn truth. I've come here to learn truth. How do I enter? truth. And the teacher said, right, there was a, a, a river running. Most temples have streams or rivers running right by where they can do washing and get water. And there was the sound of the stream was very loud. And the teacher said, do you hear the sound of the stream? And the young monk said, yes. And the master said, enter there. So, monk came to the temple and said, Teacher, I've come here to learn truth. What is truth? And the master said, Do you hear the sound of the buzzing lights? <coughs> the sea. And the monk said, Yes. And the master said, Enter there. So, every day we see, but we don't believe what we see. We see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think. But we don't believe that this experience is truth. Yet Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, just become as a child again. Right? To enter the kingdom of heaven, become as a child again. So when you see, just see. When you hear, just hear. When you smell, just smell. When you taste, just taste. Then you and this universe completely become one. That's all. Then there's no inside, no outside. No me, no you. There's just that sound. So Zen teaching often uses demonstrations. In Korean Buddhism, when a great monk gets up to give a Dharma speech, takes a stick. Maybe I'll use my bottle of water. We'll take a stick and hold it up. At the beginning of the talk, it's a great teaching tradition in Korean Buddhism. A great monk will get up with a stick and hold the stick up and say, do you see this? And then lower it. And say, do you hear that? My Dharma speech is already finished. And get down off the seat and leave. So that's pointing to something very fundamental. One time the Buddha was about to give a Dharma talk. 1,200 uh, 1, people gathered to hear the Buddha give a talk on Vulture Peak in India. And of course, the Buddha had taught for 45 years, so they were expecting uh, uh, the usual talk that he's going to give. <laughs> Maybe with a few variations for today. Then he gets up there, he sits. All the people are waiting. Five minutes. Ten minutes. Buddha not, is not saying anything. Fifteen minutes. People are wondering, he's a little old, maybe, uh, maybe he's, uh, uh, you know, maybe someone should poke him or something like that. <laughs> and the Buddha just sits there, five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Everyone's waiting for his Dharma speech about truth. What will he say about truth today? And suddenly he just reached down in the rock and picked up a flower. Picked up a flower and just went. Then, no one understood. Everyone was. <laughs> <clears throat> but only one person, very far in the back, one old monk, Mahakashiva, smiled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great talk. <laughs> then the Buddha said, my teaching you already understand. My, my eye of nirvana, seeing clearly all things I transmit to you. Only that one person 
Everyone else is looking for a speech, looking for a concept, looking for a teaching, looking for some sort of idea. But the Buddha, to teach truth, just held up something and showed people something. Just so just seeing, that's true. But the minute you open your mouth and call it truth, that's a mistake. So he just held up this flower. Nobody understood that, that was his Dharma talk about truth. Showing. Just like Jesus said, have eyes, but don't see. Have ears, but don't hear. So Zen teaching often uses this. <coughs> so when you're thinking your mind and my mind are separate, when we're thinking your mind and my mind are separate, when you're not thinking your mind and my mind are the same, that's because your before thinking mind is your nature. My before thinking mind is my nature. Your nature, my nature, cat nature, dog nature, whole universe is nature. It's the same nature. How do we prove that we have the same nature? Christians, Buddhists, Koreans, Americans, uh, the, uh, the, maybe someone from Honduras, maybe someone from Spain, maybe someone from France. Many, many different natures. But at this point, in this experience, huh! everybody's nature is the same. Everybody heard that. The same moment, the same time. Educated, not educated. Buddhist, not Buddhist. Meditating, not meditating. Everyone's nature is the same nature. So, there's a very, a very great monk in uh, Korea. Uh, his name was Chun Song Sin. He was a great Zen master. Also very wild, very free. Very, very, very wild. Very, very, very free. He did whatever he wanted. Ate whatever he wanted. Drank whatever he wanted. Said whatever he wanted. <laughs> very famous for very, he used any kind, of, any kind of bad speech. But he was a very great, deeply, deeply enlightened master. So one day he was giving a Dharma speech. And uh, in Korea, if you've ever gone to, if you ever get a chance, please go visit some of the temples in Korea. They're some of the most beautiful architectural uh, and spiritual places in the world. Uh, he was, uh, if you go to the temple, sometimes you see dogs and cats. There are certain dogs and cats that just hang around the temple. No matter what you do, you try to kick them out, they just come right back. So my teacher would always say, yeah, before life, there were a monk or nun who made some mistakes. Now they're trying to get back. <laughs> it's true. Some cats and dogs, there's some kind that never come near the temple. There's some, you can beat them with a stick, and they're just going to find a way to get back in the temple. And the food isn't that good in the temple for if you're a dog right now. Either. It's mushy old rice every single day. Bad vegetables, too. So anyway, um, this... One day he's giving a talk, and uh, in the summertime, especially as you know from here, uh, in, uh, in the summertime, dogs and cats, when they get very, 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 very hot, in Korean temples, underneath the floor of the temple, it's, it's only a one floor, but underneath the floor of the temple, there's a little space for air to pass through to keep it cool. And dogs and cats will climb into that hole, it's a little space under, and they'll hang out in this very cool space underneath the temple floorboards underneath the floorboards. So one day, Chung Song City, there was a dog, you know, they come in and out under there and they kind of hang out. They're usually under there in the summer. So one day he gave a Dharma talk. He raised his stick. Big Zen stick. And he said, does everybody see your nature? And then he hit the stick. Boom! Does everybody hear your nature? What do you understand? That everybody... <laughs> but suddenly when he hit it on the ground, underneath... <laughs> then he said, that dog understands his nature better than you. <laughs> so that Zen teaching, it's very simple. Actually, human life, this life is very simple, very clear. When we follow our thinking, it's complicated, it's stressful, it is anxious, it is worried, it is fearful. It's resentful, it's desirous. But actually, it's very, very, just like Jesus said, becoming like a child again. Just perceiving in this moment. When you see, just see. When you hear, just hear. 
this fits, the dog, Arr! that nature, just seeing, just hearing, just smelling, just tasting, just touching, already our nature functions, our true nature functions. So all the human beings heard that sound. All the human beings heard that sound. But I think some great mystery. But in the same moment, this dog heard that and reacted. Arr, arr. So Chun Song Sim said, yeah, that dog understands his nature better than all you human beings. So that's a very simple point. So that's Zen. So Zen is very, very, very stupid. <laughs> it's very stupid. It's so stupid even a dog can understand. <laughs> But it's so clear, it's so clear that even a human being cannot practice it, we say. It's so simple, even a child can understand it, but an adult cannot put it into practice. That is our everyday life. So Zen teaching is pointing back to our nature, not through a dogma, not through an ideology, a theology, a religion, a philosophy, a belief system, but rather pointing to our nature in this moment. Pointing directly to our nature in this moment. That's it. So that's the conclusion of my one-way Dharma talk. Does anyone have any questions? Any kinds of questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Ah, this water is cool and delicious. Just don't call it a self. Yes? You said that the minute you um, give a word or a definition to the sound or a sound for the self, you are not really, as I'm thinking, you're, it's not the true nature yes. at that point. Yes. It limits it. Yes. Because it's what you believe. Yes. And that would be the constant. Yes. So. Zen is going to be personal and abstract because when if you're if, what, what, the, I guess my question to you is if this question is you were asked who are you yeah you really can't answer that only you know <laughs> or do you know? <laughs> Something perceives that. Something, and everyone has it. And the really good people have it, and the really bad people have it. <clears throat> we heard that. Everyone has it. You can call that a self, you can call that a personal, you can call that an ego, you can call that a me, a soul, a consciousness, a spirit, soul. But it's none of those names. It's not arrived at through understanding. You have two eyes, yeah? How do you know you have two eyes? Can your eyes see your eyes? Can your eyes see your eyes? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Can your eyes see your eyes? But you have eyes! So, you see. So you know you have eyes. <coughs> Something heard that. Something. Something. And everyone has it. So if you call it a self, or a person, or an ego, or a mind, or a consciousness, it's wrong. <laughs> There's just experiencing it. That's all. So human beings make a name for this, but it functions. It's always functioning 24 hours a day. But the point is, we spend our whole day following our thinking. Yes, what am I going to do tomorrow? Your, your body is walking a very simple, a very simple action. 
But your mind, what am I going to do? Oh, I have to handle oh, that test. I have the test on Friday. Oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, I, I hate my teacher. Well, I don't know. Well, my teacher's a jerk. Well, I, that means well, I'm going to go to this. Well, I'm going to go to this. Well, I'm going to go to this. Well, what am I? Oh, next week I'm going to go to Disneyland. Oh, I'm not going to do this. Let's go to LA. LA, LA is better than that. We're going to get yesterday, tomorrow, 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 yesterday, last month, next, next year, last month, when I first fell in love, next year, when I get married, well, when my kids grow up, around and around and around and around and around and around and around. And around. But your body is doing a very simple thing. It's hearing, but it doesn't hear. It's in its thinking. It's seeing things, but it's not seeing. It's involved in its thinking. It's smelling, tasting, touching, but it's not experiencing those things fully. It's in its thinking. So what is this thing that experiences all of that? We don't pay attention to that. Therefore, we make suffering for ourselves, make suffering for our, this whole world. So, Zen is not a personal thing. It's not an abstract thing. It's very clear. How many fingers do you see? Yeah. <laughs> How many fingers do you see? Five. Good. Just sees. And it's interesting. When I asked you, he at the same time went like that. Yeah. It's the same nature. You're a woman, he's a man. You might be something, he might be something. You might, be, you might be very educated at this school, he was very educated at that school. You might be conservative, but how many fingers do you see? Boom! It's the same nature. Your nature, his nature, my nature, her nature, his nature, his nature, his nature. It's the same nature. Boom! Same nature. When you hit the thing, the dog. The dog. It's not an I, that's not a me. Okay. So Zen teaching is pointing at that. Then, when we become aware of that, as we become aware of that, that limitless, some people call it God, or Buddha, or consciousness, or mind, or the absolute, or the spirit, or the soul, or the Holy Spirit, or Christ's nature, but it has none of those. When we become aware of that, then we can use that to help this world. Then when a hungry person comes, we can give them something to eat. When a thirsty person comes, we can give them something to drink. Okay? Yes. Yes. How does one synthesize Zen in a, when you're immersed in a society that most of us in this room are? How do we get to that simple place with all the complexities that are surrounding us? This water is cool and delicious. <laughs> really? That, just that. Yes. It's not a theory. It's when you're doing something, completely becoming one with that. If you let go of your thinking, you and your action completely becomes one. But when you're thinking, you and your action are separate. You and your life are separate. You know that Ram Das had the very famous teaching, be here now. Three words, be here now. That's Zen. Yes, sure, sure. The, the Zen teachings, are they, how, how do they, or are there any examples you can give of how it gets one to just be there? Is there some other than just accepting it and doing Meditation. Meditation. Because Zen is experience, it's not a theory, it's not a good idea. <laughs> Zen is not some good idea or a theory. It's not a dogma or an ideology. It's not a religion. Zen is not even Zen. Zen means completely perceive, just perceive this moment. You know, they say, the difference, you know, we say in, in Buddhism, there's Buddhas and sentient beings. Sentient beings is all sentient life that goes around and around. All living life goes around and around and around and around. Everything from the tiniest, tiniest paramecium to the most developed multi-organism with self-reflective power, human beings. And gods and beings. So those are called sentient beings. And someone who's really realized their nature, we say is a Buddha. A Buddha. So, the only difference, Buddhas and sentient beings are exactly the same. Buddhas and sentient beings are exactly the same nature, except for one difference. Sentient beings follow their thinking. 
Just follow their thinking around and around and around and around and around and around and around out of habit. Follow their thinking. That's a sentient being. Buddhas simply do not follow their thinking. Simply do not attach, means don't attach to the yeah. use thinking. I flew down here from Newark Airport this morning, early in the morning. I have schedule, I have planned this schedule, gotta get on the plane. You know, if I not completely not attached to thinking, sitting out there on the runway, that's not gonna get me there. <laughs> I have schedule, got to check my e-ticket, got to go into my email, what's my e-ticket say? Do I got to print one of these stupid e-tickets out now? I, guess more to get, I don't know, I'm just writing that. I'll write down the number, see when I get to the airport what they say to me. When I get there, okay, when I get there, okay, I don't have any fluids in my bag, okay. But I use thinking, I'm a monk, I have a busy schedule, just like you, but not attached to my thinking. Because all thinking is fundamentally empty. All thinking is fundamentally unreal. It's not substantial. It's like a dream you had last night. In the dream, a tiger is chasing you. Someone is hunting you with a gun. You're running away. Hiding. Running, hiding, running, hiding. He's going to get me. Oh my God. I don't want to die here. Oh my God. I got some things to do. Oh my God. Then you wake up. Oh. Oh, this is my bed. This is, this is my wife. This is my, this is my room. <sighs> now, until you are, when you're in that dream, that dream is real. It's your world. But the minute you wake up from that dream, the dream has no power over you. That's the same with our thinking. It's the same with our thinking. Our anger, our anxiety, our fear, our doubt, our worry, our hatred, our judgment, our karma. Karma just means mind. So everyone is attached to their thinking. They think their thinking is real. So their thinking controls them. Controls them. Because you think your thinking is real. Like the stuff happening in the dream. But your thinking is fundamentally not substantial. So waking up from that, waking up from that dream, that's Buddhism. So one more story connected with that, just to show you. The Buddha was a very simple, regular person, a prince. Okay, now that's a prince. And he was going to become the king of the country at some point. And he had a very fundamental question. He saw life and death and disease on the streets of outside the palace. So he got this very strong determination and sat down and kept this question, what am I? And after years of, of hard practice, eventually he got enlightenment. Okay, that's the story. Then um, he got up from that posture and was walking down a road. And he was walking down a road and this farmer was coming in the opposite direction leading a cow or something like that. And the farmer saw this bright, beautific, radiant, absolutely glorious, shining face of this young man. And the farmer fell down on his face. The farmer fell down on his face and said, what kind of God are you? Which God, you know, in India there's like Rama and Vishnu and, and, and many kinds of gods that appeared. Krishna, Many gods that appeared in everyday life is as farm workers or children or helpers or whatever. So in India, that was a common belief to have that that experience was possible. So this guy fell down. He said, this is a god. He said, what god are you? What god are you? And how can I worship you? And this young man said, I'm not a god. And you do not need to worship me. Then the farmer guy said, well, what kind of demigod are you? And who is the god who you serve? Who's your boss? And this young man said, I am not a demigod, and I serve no god. Of that kind. I have no boss, in the sense that you're asking. Then the guy said, well, what kind of great spiritual being are you? And what is the teaching that you propose? And he said, I'm not a great spiritual being, and I don't have a teaching for you to learn. It's a very important point. Then the guy said, well, are you a, are you a great sage? 
And do you have some way? And he said, I'm not a sage, and I have no way that is different from your life. Then the guy said, well, then are you a teacher? He said, I'm not a teacher. They said, well, are you a, a man? And he said, I'm not a man. Then the guy said, well, are you a human being? Because, you know, those days they had things that were not male, not female walking around. And he said, I'm not a human being. Now, here's an interesting point. Then the guy said, well, then what are you? And the young man said, I am awake. That's what I am. So the word for waking up in Sanskrit is Buddha. Buddha. So Buddha is a term, the one that just woke up. Woke up to its fundamental nature. Woke up to its fundamental nature. In the Western tradition, we can call that a Christ. A fully realized human being. Okay? So, the point is, in our everyday life, when you follow your thinking, when you follow your habitual thinking, you enter all sorts of hells, all sorts of suffering realms. Yeah, not places. You still live in Florida. It doesn't look like there's a... I've been in places in the world that look like there's a heck of a lot more suffering than the everyday life here. <laughs> You're still in Florida. It's still cool. It's still have air conditioning. But when you follow your thinking, you, we enter all sorts of hells and suffering realms. And John Milton said in Paradise Lost, the mind is its own place and makes a hell of heaven and a heaven of hell. So, when we follow our thinking, we enter hell and heaven. But when we don't follow our thinking, when we just see it for what it is, That's a Buddha. Okay? Yeah. Thank you very much for your teaching. Yes. Uh, being where you are, and uh, as you perceive the world now, I ask you again your, your sister's original doubt. She saw the ladies who were sick with deformities, and she saw herself, she, you, and the born into the circumstances you were. I ask you why. Um, one thing that really blows me away about uh, Buddhism is that it's very scientific. Even Albert Einstein acknowledged that. Go, go home and Google this when you get a chance. Google, when you get to your Google, put in Albert Einstein and Buddhism. And uh, there are two places where Einstein talked about Buddhism. There are two specific quotes that are very often quoted about, that they're, they're often kind of put together to mush together. Um, and he acknowledged that he felt that Buddhism was the most scientific religion that he had ever met. First point, before I, I, I'm getting to your answer. And then the Buddha, what's really interesting about the Buddha's teachings is before the Buddha died, he said, don't believe anything I said. <laughs> now here's a guy who's been teaching for 45 years all over in northern India. And he says, don't believe anything I said just because I said it. Investigate it yourself. Investigate it yourself. And if your experience proves that what I said is true, then I taught you the truth. And if your experience shows that what I taught was false, then you can know that I taught you a lie. You find out. Okay, so, this very interesting. There's this scientific doubt in Buddhism. It has the kind of doubt of a scientist. But it is scientifically empirical to the extent that science is ever complete in its answers. Okay, so, here's the, the, the straight-on answer to your question. But that is the background. Everything in this universe happens by cause and effect. We, ourselves, appearing here, are cause and effect. 
cause and effect. Cause and effect. The universe appearing, the universe's expansion, cause and effect. They've gotten the, 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 the existence of the universe down to a millisecond. You know, isn't that cool the way they do that? Scientists are really interesting. It's scary in that way. <laughs> well, in the first one billionth of a second of the existence of the universe, it was expanding out at a rate of some, some, some hundred thousand light years.